Um, it's my pleasure to be talking today with uh, Louis de Puer, the uh, winner, the fourth winner of the Lawrence O'Shaughnessy Poetry Award uh, offered by the Center for Irish Studies in the University of St. Thomas. Um, congratulations on the award, Louis. Thanks, Patrick. We, uh, we are delighted to be talking to you today. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about how you began your journey into poetry? Um, I suppose up to a point, like everybody else in Ireland, um, I had written from a very early age, uh, part of school room assignments and all of the rest of it, but um, I began to be a little bit more serious that when I was about 18 or 19 years old, I took part in um, workshops at University College Cork, and I was writing in English at that stage, uh, really very bad poetry in English, and never really, whether it was good or bad was almost irrelevant, it was the fact that uh, it, it, it was unfamiliar to me that I wasn't really, it didn't have my signature, whatever that right. might be. Right, right, right. And um, I became aware around about that time of a, a considerable revival in Irish language writing going back to the 1970s, people like Michael Davitt, Nolan E. Honel and others, but particularly Michael Davitt was probably the first Irish language poet uh, to, to write out of an urban situation and the fact that the urban situation was Cork made him all the more um, interesting to me. He also brought whole sections of, I suppose, American culture into mm -hmm. Irish language poetry. He's very, very influenced by blues music and very influenced by Bob Dylan, whom he thinks is a great poet. We kind of differ maybe a bit on that. Right, but, right, right. Uh, he, he opened up other possibilities. And when I started writing in Irish, um, again, I wouldn't be very proud maybe now looking back of some of the things I wrote, but it was, it was certainly mine, mm -hmm. which is something I could never say about what I wrote in English. So. Um, I've continued from writing from about that time. I was very fortunate when I was at university. There was a man called Sean O'Toole, who was professor of Irish there, who was an enormous influence on, on, a, on the previous generation of Irish language poets that I mentioned, right, right. and on mine as well. And he organised workshops every Christmas in West Kerry, and people like Michael Hartnett, who had just get, written his farewell to English and written his first book in Irish, came the first year, 1978. He came, and we were the first people to see the proofs of this book, which was quite an extraordinary literary event at the time. And then Nolan Ihonel came back from Turkey and she came to this workshop, David came to the workshop, and we felt very close to the heart of something that was going on, uh, albeit that it was going on invisibly to the rest right. of literary culture in Ireland. Right, um, right, right. That's probably the biggest aspect of the journey that you, you mentioned is that when I started writing in Irish, to write in, in Irish was automatically to be invisible right. in the wider literary culture in Ireland, and that's no longer the case, happily. Right, right. right. Now, you were, you were 10 years in Australia, if I understand correctly. <coughs> um, can you talk a little bit about how Australia influenced your appreciation for the Irish, Irish culture and the Irish imagination? Um, Australia was crucial to me in all kinds of ways, personal, literary, and other ways. Um, the, the whatever I've achieved in poetry is largely down to the huge change in my own attitude to writing poetry while I was in Australia. Uh, Australia is a terrifically enabling place, whereas mm -hmm. when I left Ireland I felt it was absolutely a disabling place. Right. And uh, so people didn't have any negative response to your announcing to them that what you actually did in this room all day was write poems, whereas in Ireland people's response might be, yeah, right. Right, right. Whereas in Australia, people would say, "Really well, show us," and um, it did, it made no difference to them at all that uh, that I wrote in Irish. That was a kind of an that was a very um, uh, freeing up process for me. That in Ireland, um, to speak Irish in a public place on the streets, Patrick Street and Cork or wherever else, is is, is either perceived as as uh, provocative in mm -hmm. some ways to people who don't speak Irish or as flag waving on behalf of some cause and either way it's kind of difficult when all you really want to do is say hello to somebody you don't right. really want to be making a political statement all the time. So in Australia the areas I lived in uh, were all areas where English was a minority language. The first area I lived in was largely a Vietnamese area and uh, people were surprised if you spoke English so for me to speak Irish to my kids on the streets there was perfectly natural and nobody took a blind bit of notice. They'd have been surprised if I didn't. Um, right, 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 and right. subsequently I lived in an Arabic and Greek area and likewise the same thing happened. So in terms of that it freed up my notion of the language that it was, it, it made it ordinary mm -hmm. in a way which, it, which, which was difficult in Ireland. And then in terms of writing poetry, um, I determined very early on as far as I possibly could that I didn't want to write emigrant poetry. 
uh, first of all, I didn't miss Ireland very much. Mm -hmm. I was very happy in Australia, and I wanted <laughs> the poems to reflect that. I wanted to let some of the light and heat and sense of possibility of Australia mm -hmm. into the patterns of the Irish language and the patterns of my poetry. So I wrote what I consider to be Australian poems, and I'm very happy that they've been accepted as such by people in Australia. And um, so that was a huge... Uh, opening up of a new arena of possibility right. for me that like the category of Irish right. was a kind of a separate thing that uh, I was writing Australian poems in the Irish language but that the identity was kind of uh, the identity aspect of it uh, wasn't problematic in the way that it might have been elsewhere uh, I didn't ever really see myself as a hyphenated poet Irish Australian or anything like that that just some of the poems by virtue of the subject matter and the patterns of imagery mm -hmm. were obviously a response to the circumstance in which I found myself. I became very interested, for instance, in the fact that a lot of the people who went to Australia in the 19th century and 20th century likewise would have been Irish speakers. Mm -hmm. And I became very curious to know how did they adapt their language to their new life and experience because it must have changed it in the same way that Australian English is recognisably different from American English or English English or Irish English. But um, unfortunately, they, they left no records of how they adapted Irish because mm -hmm. they largely came from an oral culture. Right, right. But um, I, I had hoped that maybe some imprint of their previous reshaping of the language might have kind of emerged in my own work when I right. was there. Right, right. Well, let's take a, let's take, take a jump into your... Uh your collections. One of your first collections. One of the first collections, uh, your earlier collections, is Sentences of Earth and Stone, which does treat uh, the Australian uh, uh, and Irish uh, sort of merging. And one of the first poems um, I'd like you to consider, which brings in sort of ideas of immigration and, and estrangement, um, is Fable. Uh, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the background of the of the poem, and then if you could read it. Okay. Um, fable, I, I'm very happy that people think sometimes reading the poem that it's about a group of old Irish men because it, it, it's a deliberate kind of, um, uh, there's a deliberate ambivalence there, but it's actually about a group of Greek men who lived in this suburb of Australia that I lived in and every Saturday morning they turn this little square outside of a big kind of impersonal shopping market they turned it almost into a little Greek village square every Saturday morning, just first of all by their presence there and by the fact that everything about them spoke of another place than the place they happened to be in. Right. Um, they all played with worry beads, they spoke Greek, um, they, they, even the way they were, even the clothes they wore was very different from what was going on around them, the people in their thongs and shorts and all the rest of it, they were kind of overdressed for the occasion and I, I admired enormously the resilience of a people that managed to maintain some kind of integrity of culture and language in that very alien environment and I kind of despaired at times at how easily Irish people have allowed themselves to be assimilated and dispersed right. Right. when they go uh, abroad or else to, to congregate around a phony notion of Irishness which I don't think these Greek men could have been accused of. And I was also interested in the fact that uh, it has been observed by a lot of people in Australia that, uh, say, Greek people particularly and older Italian people, um, that the form of the language that they speak is already dead uh, because it is, it is two or three generations back from where contemporary Greek language is at. Mm -hmm. So that when they go back to Greece or the Italians go back to Italy, they have difficulty being understood even though they've never stopped speaking their native language. Right, right, right. So I was kind of curious in that that there was this kind of... Um, like this thing that was outside of time in some ways and that once they stopped speaking these words that the language as they spoke it and knew it would disappear completely um, and yet they kept speaking I thought that was it. that was the interesting thing so maybe I'll yeah. read the, the translation first and then read the poem when the mountains get together in the square behind the market they speak a language of olives and time the argo of old men on stone benches talking of the ups and downs of their lives across the seas of immigrant years. A surplus white light pouring from the well of their gapped mouths and the sun a gold tooth gleaming in their chalk white talk. They speak of sultry days, slow as a spavined mule, panniers brimming with long afternoons that ripened in moist heat like the skin-dark thoughts of men who were tall and awkward as mountains until shoulders slumped under the weight of a sky that drove their easy-going bodies beyond the unhurried stroke of their gentle hearts. 
Their palsied fingers count hiccuping heartbeats on chattering worry beads, and they grip each other close when they shake hands, surprised to have stood another week, ter terrified it may be their last. Sometimes it is, when silence fills their mouths with sentences of earth and stone that leave the mountains speechless, their words forget themselves, and no one listens anyway to the wooden language of the dead. Nur chaster na knick er a chéile sa chéar nóg ar chúl an éanig, lauríd canúint a lóg is tíma na gríanár ar vínsí clíhe, e caint ar íslain is ardáin a maha har léar na mlíant a imirca. Éil sol a sorplís gial, chó taúl e búlí clóg um van lé, e cashmar nach as umar a meal montach, agus fíacúil óar na gréanna e glisgar nach in a meal lagar calca. Trocht an siad ar léhant a brúhl, chó maúl e miúl spad chosach, Fe chliaf e cwrh ar mwyl e tranonti fada, a dabig fe yn tas mwe, a wyl marana e cnas dorach yn y fair, a fairan e nis ar yn mean, a fi cho hard, cho hamsgwyl e chliaf. Nŵg ar chrom yng ngwyl i fe ro ŵl ach sgamol, a frustig a grihe ar y mwyl e sef. Ae ri yn y meir a paralysioch a snag fwyl i cri ar fadyrin y hymeni, is crihan siad laif le chael a gudlu, le hwnt a sgwr hasadar siacht yn ele os cyn talaf. Le hagla gyr a bai an uir yernach e, uir anta e sa. Nur a lian an an tost a meil le goban cre as cloch a valavi an alagur na gnoc, ni chaster na knick ar a chéile, ni chloster clarchaint na marav. Very good. Um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the whole problem, conundrum of, uh, of uh, translating from the Irish into the English and trying to retain, uh, <coughs> you know, trying to retain the, the, the the intricacy and the the essence of the Irish uh, expression. Yeah, it's it's very problematic. I, I've tried to introduce the term half playfully, the term of forgeries, to refer to right, the right, translations, right. just simply to allow the fact that there is for people to allow that there is a question mark always over a translation uh, until you know its provenance. Um, there are several aspects to it. One is that I found it more difficult as time has gone on to be actually be able to translate what I think I'm about. Mm. In, uh, in the Irish. For as long as the, the principal technique of your poetry has to do with imagery and colour on the surface, if you like, of the language, that translates fairly readily, I think, from one language to another, or that's been my experience in any right, case. Right. But if you're doing anything that's kind of little distortions and contortions of language, which depend on a knowledge of what you're, what you're what you're distorting or, or working against the grain of, right, right, right. that can be enormously difficult to translate from one language to another. Right. Um, the more recent poems I've been, I've been uh, writing uh, take liberties with syntax in Irish in a way which should be confronting to an Irish reader, mm -hmm. but to break syntax in English would be a very, very different kind of a matter like it, it doesn't it doesn't have a parallel a direct parallel right right um, so th there are problems what you I think what you try to do is there are certain things which you if you translate directly uh, lose a lot of their impact so there are but sometimes there are possibilities that open up in other parts of a poem which will allow you some way of compensating for the fact that one line has gone a little bit flat on you and you can tighten up maybe another line right, right, right. but it, it it's um, it varies from one point to the other. Some of them just happen really easily and are very close, and sometimes a literal translation is perfect. Other times you have to take enormous liber liberties with your own work to try and get close to uh, the impact or the impression that you want to the original point to have. Do you, do you ever find, or is it impossible to determine, that the English forgery is an improvement of the Irish original? Or is it just impossible to even determine uh, it? I, I, I don't think I, that that has ever quite happened, but sometimes the other side of it, of course, is like I am bilingual, and it would be false of me to pretend that I'm completely uncomfortable with English. I'm not, right, right, right. and uh, I think the forgeries are reasonably good up to a point. Um, every now and again, thing happens between the two languages, and you find that the English poem extends what you were about right, in right. the original, and that's brilliant when that happens. That's absolutely fantastic because that's, and it's also very proper. In terms of where I'm coming from, that I that I'm between two languages in some ways. Right, right, right. So that's wonderful when it happens, but it happens far, far too rarely for for my taste. Right, right, right. Usually, what you have the impression of is that you're you're running very fast to stand still, that you, you you're duplicating, you're doubling the amount of effort to not go backwards, um, rather than actually 
having your thing appear in stereo in some way, you know. Right, 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 right. right. Um, let's let's take a look at another poem. Uh, let's the Isle of the Dead is a is a it sort of brings in the image it sort of the images of, of Christ and sort of colonialism, and again it's it's. Um, it has a certain uh, Australian uh, uh, element to it. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about its uh, genesis. Yeah, uh, the the Isle of the Dead is the burial ground associated with Port Arthur, which is the most one of two or three very brutal penal settlements in Australia. Right. It was where the so-called incorrigibles were sent, people who reoffended before their original sentence uh, had been served out. And it was a place of enormous um, brutality. Uh, without a doubt, it's the most disturbed and disturbing place I've ever visited in, in my life. And uh, it has become a kind of a, a, a scene of a centre of pilgrimage, almost a kind of almost a profane or secular pilgrimage for people, particularly Irish people in Australia, find the place very moving to go there. And um, the poem arose out of, I mean, I had gone there a number of times uh, and connected with it in a very kind of shocking way. I was quite taken aback by the, the passage of time or the fact that a heritage centre had been built around it had done almost nothing to assuage the essential disturbance and sense of brutality that can be felt in the place. And um, one of the things I was most interested in is there, it was the, the conjunction of religion and uh, reform, the, the notion of reformation uh, associated with the most brutal form of, of prison treatment. Right, right, that right. The basic philosophy of the place was that, um, that the body should be degraded and brutalized as much as possible to allow somebody to come closer to a notion of the soul right. and close to godliness. Right, right, right. And uh, terrible brutality was visited upon the prisoners uh, in pursuit of that. There was a technology associated with so that the, be the beds they slept in were deliberately six inches too narrow to allow you to sleep comfortably during the mm. night so that if you turned at all you would either hit the wall or you would fall out. Um, they had a thing there called the deaf and dumb cell where uh, people were put in solitary confinement and you could neither hear anything from the outside world or see it, nor could you be heard no matter how loudly you screamed. So sensory deprivation, which we kind of think was a, a Margaret Thatcher invention in Northern Ireland in the 1970s, they did this back in the 19th century in, in Port Arthur. Um, prisoners were not allowed to look anybody in the eye. Right, um, right, right. They were made to wear a cap shaped like a duck's beak which came out in a peak like that so that they couldn't actually look at somebody in the eye lest they take comfort from somebody else, some sense of compassion in others. Right, right, right. Um, and that the Isle of the Dead is where they're buried and there's a, an extraordinary irony there in that uh, when you go the guide takes you around the island and they, they stop at each headstone which is erected to the memory of one of the administrators or one of the soldiers that died there and there may be 30 or 40 such graves there and there are 1400 prisoners buried there in unmarked graves and nobody even takes the time of day to stop and tell you any of their stories. So I investigated a little bit the stories, their records for all of the people who were mm -hmm. there and um, that's basically where the poem comes from. Wonderful. Do you want to read part of it? Please. Um, the Isle of the Dead. The headstones face home to England where a world is turning against the sun her colonies, a fleet of drifting stars, follow the glow of a fake lodestone, lured by its deceiving light. Buried here, the military dead, whose gold-braided uniforms once reflected the glory of a tarnished crown, levying their glittering tithes on the unstinting sun. Grave letters belie the ordinariness of their deaths, the cancerous pride or guilt of those who witnessed God's word in men's mouths distort the lot of other men's lives. The pomp of stone hides the cruelty or shame of those who submitted to the word with conscience gagged until worms undid the knot, weaving their truth through cages of bone. A salt wind from the sea eats the sandstone, soft as bones return to dust, under headstones facing forever north, straight as a spine, unbending as a soldier's mind, never deviating from straight and narrow lines that his will be done on this barbarous earth. Their backs perpetually turned from the rabble, scum of the earth sent here across the sea, that their twisted natures be rectified, their stubborn bodies made to bend. You must remember these were bad boys who had to be shown the error of their wicked ways, explained the guide. Ex-army in polished shoes and priest-clean nails, 
his sweet talk fouling the air with mouldering lies. On the south side of the island, away from the sea, the convicts lie as they did in life, on edge, in cramped beds that hurl them against walls or knock them to the floor if they moved in their sleep. A devout technology to teach the thing, the body itself is a jail to be rent asunder, releasing God's image imprisoned within. And so they wore the lash like a hair shirt and a mantle of lime ever after, wearing the flesh to bone, marrow to pith and pulp, to reveal Christ crucified in man's image, if pigs could fly. Despite their zeal, they found no trace of the divine in the no thing, no one whose passing remains unmarked in a grave without stone, pointless to pray for the souls of animals. There's a piece here by Anthony Trollope on a grave digger who tended the graves of, the, of those buried on the Isle of the Dead, and in 1873 Trollope says this about him. But of all the men, the most singular in his fate was another Irishman, one baron, who lived in a little island all alone. And of all the modes of life into which such, such a man might fall, surely his was the most wonderful. To the extent of the island, he was no prisoner at all, but might wander whither he liked, might go to bed when he pleased, might bathe and catch fish or cultivate his little flower garden, and was in very truth monarch of all he surveyed. For ten years, John Barron worked his two-acre plot, a holy fool in his garden, refusing to go back on the mainland or eat the produce of unholy ground, as though it were blasphemy to taste the earthly remains of Christ-made man interred in unconsecrated earth. A blessed lunatic, he worked the brutalised earth, turning the black sod scored with lime and dark with the shadow of the dead, until a mercy of unnamed flowers blossomed in every orifice, pouring from eyes, ears, armpits, thighs and broken mouths that left no sign but what the softer clay remembers, scorch marks of flaming flesh and bone, as though one man's kindness might redeem the depravity of his kind. You should go down on your knees on this sacred ground and pray, my pagan companion counselled, but I will not bend my heart or my knee. Better to wear a cowl to hide the shame of man-made nothing, to cover your face, lest the remnant of light reflected in your eye absolve the irredeemable dark. They wore the hangman's hood during their worst torment, lest the mind find comfort in the face of another, and eyes towel the print of terror from a condemned man's countenance. And still, most of them rose again most of the time, and carried on their shame without relief, until the carpenter's hammer nailed down their final pain. If I call them out, the grass will not reveal their names until the wind bows the stunted trees as they stand to attention, and from the deaf and dumb cell of the earth a multitude rises before the sun, straight and proud as headstones. Thomas Kelly, a carpenter, Edwin Pinner, a miner, John Bowden, a barber, James Parsons, sailor, Thomas Logue, a cobbler, and a metal of labourers shoveling earth from their eternal dust Terence McMahon from County Clare, John Arnold, Norbury, John Healy, a Kerryman, and their comrades as yet unnamed, a roll call unopened, a snail's trail across eternity, a shower of rain without stain that bows my head, an inflexible knee in supplication to the earth. Very good, very good. Let's, let's take a look though, let's take a jump into your, your other collection. Cork and other poems. Cork, of course, the Venice of Ireland. As, it's, uh, as it is known. Um, there's a couple of great poems here that deal with more of your, your returning experience. Um, uh, Silk of the Kine, but particularly Usheen. Perhaps we could jump into Usheen there, okay. page 16. Yep. Um, the experience of returning, the, the sense of, of, of opening your imagination to the depth and the, the suffering of the Irish experience, but also just creating a greater awareness of the, of, of the Irish spirit cast away from the shores and the finally return. Can you talk a little bit about the context of the title of that? <laughs> yeah, and the uh, it, it was one of the things that occurred to me the, the very first time I came back to Ireland from Australia. I'd been away maybe three or four years at that stage and um, I was very shocked at how old everybody had got all of a right. sudden. Right, right, right. And I, I felt that I hadn't aged at all. Obviously, uh, that wasn't quite the case, but right, right, right. I, it suddenly made sense to me that, that maybe that was part of 
the metaphorical aspect of the story of Oshin goes to Tir Nanog, stays there for three years, which is actually 300 years in real time, and he comes back and everybody is all wizened and shriveled, and as soon as he touches the ground of Ireland, he becomes instantly shriveled and old as well. And I had this idea that when you're away, um, y you're out of time in some ways, and uh, y because you're taken out of the context which allows you to measure the passage of years in your life, uh, whether it's in terms of All-Ireland Finals or watching your parents grow old or whatever. You have no measure of that in, in, in the new world, it right. seemed to me. And, um, and you feel in some ways that you're not ageing at all. I'm sure part of that was to do with the climate and the much healthier lifestyle that I had in Australia as well. <laughs> but um, when I went back to Ireland, I just had that feeling that uh, I was instantly much older myself by virtue of touching down in right, Ireland right, and right. Uh, I was amongst shriveled puny people again. <laughs> <laughs> they love me for saying that. <laughs> Oshin. As soon as I climbed from the sky horse and set foot on the ground, I saw my reflection brought down to size in your narrowed eyes. My breath quickened as you wrapped your arms around me. Bones became straw under the weight of your welcome home. By the time we reached the revolving door, your shadow was too much for my puny shoulders, and the world without end I'd left behind on the runway, gathering speed over Tusker Rock. Ni tushka hurling machusht and spare ach is hagvigarish lesh a dalav, na chnuk maskail girte it huil, krapahe dirt, no gavilach gandua, e gaela de vak imrishk. Hirig manail, nor a churish de live im himpel, lagig machna fe ulach de hied file to rome or ash. Nor a glanamer doris on air for the mach, vi the skyl rove o'er them hooling, is in tiriach the dogus er hunt on air or mahliish dach, a skinna mach or tusker rach. Very good, very good. There's another, another poem of yours which uh, sort of uh, is a, there's a there's a dimension of, of um, almost almost religious celebration I find in this poem. It's on the light, it's called. Right. Um, page 32. Um, okay. I wonder if you could. Talk about that a little bit. It's, it's simple, but, yeah. but uh, 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 sort of enchanting. In a yeah. very it's um, it's a poem I have nothing really to say about because it is that simple, and it, it was just a lyric moment, right. uh, I suppose, in time. And uh, so the only thing I could say about it is that um, I found myself rejecting for a very, very long time, uh, on ideological grounds, a lot of uh, the symbology, if I could call it that, of the Catholic Church. Right. which was a huge part of my own childhood and the childhood of, childhood of most people growing up in Ireland. So when, for doctrinal reasons, I separated myself from the teaching of the church, I, 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 I separated myself from the iconography of the church as well. And it was mm -hmm. only when I was in Australia I really felt that I was kind of cutting off my nose to spite my face right, and right. that I was entitled to use these images because they had deep meaning for them, even if I no longer subscribed to the value systems that they embodied. But as as um, as icons or images that they still had a great lingering power for me. Right, 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 so right, right, right. The light. And again today, the light is soft as butter on bread fresh from the oven. You could put it in your mouth and let it melt like Holy Communion on your tongue, or place it in a jar in the medicine box, a sovereign remedy for the heart, a poultice to draw poison from a festering brain in the fever of winter. Well. Uh, with that, with that idea of solace and solace, uh, it gives me great pleasure to wrap up this uh, conversation today with uh, Louis de Poer, the O'Shaughnessy uh, winner of the uh, Poetry Award with the University of Saint Thomas. Thank you very much, Louis. We very much. Miller Mahagut. Arishin yov ta solas ko min gar yaslata laha er aran on ayim alaiha er nos ayin aulin er da hanga. No Horigroka, a gopher and a gogus, e a client, a knasoig the cree, Kerin of Winnig Niv and Aurish as Agin and Horacha, and I'm sure Vorokoch and Hierig.